Hello, everybody. I'm Howie Hawkins. I was the Green Party candidate for president in 2020, and this is Green Socialist Notes, where we talk about uh, continuing to educate and organize around the eco-socialist program that Angela Walker and I ran on. So let me start by talking about, well, tomorrow's May Day, and I'll be going to an event here in Syracuse at the Workers' Center. I got the T-shirt on. And uh, so that's a, you know, group that move, works mostly with immigrant workers, low wage workers. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of movement on those areas. We've, we've got, uh, you know, some unionization success at uh, Amazon and Starbucks and now Dollar General. There's uh, activity going on. So, you know, hopefully this means the revival of the labor movement. That right now, we, you know, we're at the level where uh, organized uh, workers in the private sector are below 6%. That's as low as it's been in over a century. And yet in the public sector, it's only 11%. So most working people don't have uh, collective bargaining and a uh, union organization where they can through which they can file grievances and deal with workplace issues. So uh, that's a huge issue. And this is the time of year I've I've written about how, and I'll do this briefly now, you know, May Day, before there was industrial capitalism, was like the first day of spring. People went out and celebrated, uh, you know, how, you know, the green earth provided, you know, the maypole and all of that. And uh, there's still some of that at this time of year, but uh, the May Day we're familiar with as a worker's day. Uh, you know, developed uh, out of the workers' movement per, in here in the United States. The Haymarket uh, massacre led to the first May Day. Uh, Lucy Parsons, one of the widows of uh, one of the Haymarket martyrs who was framed up on throwing a bomb. That was, nobody knows who actually threw that bomb at that demonstration for the eight-hour workday in Chicago. Um, she pushed that idea of a workers' day, a May Day, internationally and it's become an international holiday and most countries in the world it's a holiday you know a public recognized holiday here it's a they tried to bury it by moving labor day to september that was the doing of uh, grover cleveland uh basically to undermine it as a uh thing that the workers movement you know had led and created and had the militancy that may day does so, you know, that's the red in May Day, but there's a green, too, that was the original May Day. And, you know, our argument for equal socialism is that the red in May Day is going to bring back the green, the sustainable society. And so uh, that's just something to think about as we, as we go into May Day. So here in New York, you know, now we're petitioning. You can see the sign behind me. I'm uh, running for governor. Green's nominated me. I'm running with uh, Gloria Matera out of Brooklyn, and we need 45,000 signatures in 42 days. It's now probably the hardest comparable petition, not just in the United States, but in the world. And, you know, I've been out there every day. I'm getting a good response from most people. Uh, working class people are the most responsive. Uh, the, the problematic people are some of those upper middle class professional uh, people who are Democrats. And, you know, they say, oh, the Green Party spoils election. They don't have any commitment to democratic rights. In fact, they support the suppression of the Green Party. And we're in a democracy crisis in this country, and they don't, it just doesn't seem to get through their thick skulls. Some of these people have had Black Lives Matter signs in their yards, and they have no idea that Black Lives Matter organization in Syracuse has been led for over a decade by two Black women who are in the Green Party here. Um, but that just shows these professionals are not really in the movement. They're not in touch with what's going on. They're kind of posturing with their yard sign. The other thing that's been really striking is Republicans have really changed. I mean, I've been saying they're no longer a conservative party. They're an extremist party. But um, it really come home to me in this petitioning. You know, before 2010, uh, we had a petition in New York to get on a ballot. And uh, a lot of the Republicans would say, sure, you know, everybody should be on the ballot. It's fair play. Um, today, the Republicans are all Trumpies and conspiracists. You know, some say no Trump, no signature. Uh, 
A lot of them will give you a harangue about how Trump actually won 2020. They're into the big lie. Others are all upset about COVID being a big hoax and how vaccines kill and they're a Democratic uh, population control plan, Democratic Party. Um, others are saying immigrants are flooding the country and some of them say it's a plot by globalist elites, sometimes Jewish globalist elites to destroy America. And then they get into the public schools, grooming kids to be gay or trans. And they'll tell the Greens, we're just too woke for them. Um, but they, they're just not signing. And they, they got these uh, crazy ideas that they, you know, want to, want to, you know, bend your ear about. So mostly when I go door to door and I look at the street list and I see it's Republican, um, I just pass it. It's, it's not worth the time to get, you know, a little lecture about COVID or immigrants or something. Um, so door to door, we get good signatures, but the best thing is to go where people congregate. So this morning, since seven o'clock until about 1130, I was out at our regional farmer's market here in Syracuse and doing great. I was there last Saturday. And then about 1130, these uh, two sheriff's deputies came up and very rudely interrupted, uh, you know, me getting a signature from signatures from a couple and, uh, you know, they just walked away, you know, they said, oh, we didn't want to get arrested. And, um, so I, I told these sheriffs, you know, deputies that uh, this is public property and they're interfering with uh, political speech, which is protected by the First Amendment. And they claimed it was private property. And I said, well, you know, why are you sheriff's deputies providing the security? And they said, well, the regional market pays the sheriff's department. I said, so what? You know, public schools, which are obviously public property, pay police or sheriff's deputies for security at events. Uh, and they still insisted that the farmer's market was private and that I would have to rent a stall like the vendors who are selling their produce. And uh, I said, well, who do I do that with? And they said, uh, with the regional market office. I said, where's that? So they escorted me over there. And I was a little disappointed, you know, people know I was out there petitioning and nobody objected, you know, why, what do you, you know, nobody said, why are you bothering him? He's not bothering anybody but for a signature. Um, but on my way there, I, I pulled out my phone. I want to take a picture of them. And they said, no, no, you can't do that. Uh, you can't take pictures here. It's private property. And I, I was walking by a surveillance camera. I said, well, what's that? And they said, it's fake. Yeah, right. So, uh, I got to the woman in the office and I said, well, you know, who owns this place? And she says, it's a state authority. And I turned to the deputies and I said, see, it's public property. And one of them said, no, it's a private enterprise. Uh, but the person in the office said I'd have to buy a permit, rent a stall and get a million dollar insurance policy to be able to, you know, be on the property with a stall. And I said, look, I'm not a business. I'm here engaged in protected First Amendment activity. And, uh, you know, she said, you're still going to have to rent a stall. So I told him I will call a lawyer, which I will. Um, so, you know, I'm leaving. And, uh, you know, I had a good morning of getting signatures. And as I'm leaving, one of the deputies says he smelled alcohol in my breath. And I can't drive my car out of the regional market. And I told him he was full of shit. That's a quote. And that I'd never drunk, you know, I've never been a drinker my whole life. Um, so, I, you know, I went to my car and I got on my phone to uh, tell another green that was petitioning on the other side of the market. This is a pretty big facility, uh, you know, just to give them a heads up about what these deputies were up to. And while I'm there, I see the sheriff's and deputies coming through the parking lot looking. They were looking for me. I think if I had tried to, you know, drive out of there while they were present, they would have tried to stop me. And, and done an alcohol test and, you know, that whatever they do to people. Um, so that's what it's like trying to get 45,000 signatures in 42 days where New York officials still think they've, they've got a democracy. You know, it's hard to find places where people congregate. The grocery stores, you know, they'll kick you out. Um, you can do it on a public sidewalk, but in Syracuse, downtown is dead. Looks like a a movie uh, set, not a you know a place where people actually do business, and that's a consequence. As I mentioned, this city is very poor. It's ranked first in child poverty, first in fa family poverty among the cities of the country. 
Same thing in Rochester, second in the country. Buffalo, sixth in the country. And forget these small towns, which are in just as hard a shape. Used to be factory towns, but now we're the Rust Belt. There's nothing going on downtown. It's all boarded up. So as I mentioned, this is, you know, the hardest petition we've got that we can find in the world. The next hardest comparable petition is in Putin's Russia, where you need 15,000 signatures in 45 days to run as an independent for the state Duma. That's their national, it's like our Congress. And uh, we've been shopping a bill around the Democratic legislatures, legislators uh, in Albany to restore the old New York standard, which was 15,000 signatures in 42 days. Little three days less than than uh, the you know petition in Russia, and you know while I'm presenting this, I joke that we're just trying to get back to the Putin standard in New York, and you know these legislators and their staff laugh, and they you know they say you're right, but they're not going to move a bill, they're not going to write a bill up and introduce it until after the election, because they don't want to cross the governor. So here we are stuck with probably the hardest petition in the world. And, uh, you know, we're doing we're doing a good job. I think, you know, we're going to at least get 45,000. Question is whether we're going to have a big enough margin to uh, sustain a challenge, which we expect from the Democrats. And in meanwhile, in New York, the whole election has gone into chaos because the Democrats did an extreme gerrymander of the uh, congressional districts and the state Senate districts. And it got thrown out of court. It was at the district court. A Republican did it, but it went all, all the way up to our court of appeals, which is our top court. It's like this you know, a Supreme Court and, uh, you know, seven Democratic justices and by a 43 decision, they threw out the Democratic partisan gerrymandered districts. So this is, you know, going to change everything. The new maps will be out by May 20th. Um, it's probably it's going to have to change the primary dates. Um, we'll probably have split primaries. June 28th is when they were, but there'll be primaries for, for Congress and state senators in, in August, it looks like. Um, and the party petitions for the people running for Congress and the state Senate technically will have to be redone, although we expect the legislature to, you know, protect themselves in that regard. Now, our petition, this really is a problem for us because we have to get 500 signatures, it, you know, good signatures in half the congressional districts in the state, which is five times the old requirement pre-2020, which was 100 signatures. But now, you know, the, the, the lines will be out, the boundaries will be out May 20th if they meet their deadline. And our petitions are due May 31st. So we've got to document how we got 500 uh, signatures in half these congressional districts. And so that makes it, you know, all the more difficult for us to do that documentation and know, you know, where we're, you know, got enough signatures to, you know, make meet that qualification. And, uh, we really can't uh, put our signatures into these congressional districts and identify, you know, what pages they're on till we know what the districts are. So, you know, they're going to pass a lot of legislation um, to, uh, you know, help themselves. The governor's got a problem. Her lieutenant governor was indicted for uh, basically fraud and bribery and, uh, falsification of records. It was basically a kickback scheme where uh, Lieutenant Governor, when he was a state senator, uh, promised a state contract in return for campaign contributions. It's pretty run-of-the-mill corruption in New York State and elsewhere, although we have, I think, more of it in New York State. And meanwhile, COVID is uh, peaking here in New York State. I put a link in the private chat for uh, Syracuse.com coronavirus which has a map. If you look at that map, you'll see you know, they got the country coded green, yellow, and orange. And green is low COVID rates, yellow is mid range, orange is high rates. And we're the epicenter of the high rates. It's pretty much upstate New York. But we're getting no relief from these politicians, uh, not like 2020 when uh, we were on a ballot, you know, statewide offices. Um, automatically because we'd had ballot access for the previous decade, but um, they cut the party petitions that, you know, the major parties had to get in half in 2020. Uh, they didn't do electronic signatures like some states did. You know, we've talked to legislators and they're not even going to, you know, think about that. Uh, they seem to want to believe COVID's over, even though COVID isn't over with us. 
And uh, so they're going to make a lot of changes to deal with their gerrymandering and the primary dates and the, the petitions, If whether they have to redo them. I expect they'll just say if you submitted a petition uh, in the party petition period, which was before the independent one that we're doing now, uh, they're just going to say it's OK. So they're probably going to say themselves and, you know, getting this lieutenant governor off the ballot, uh, you know, who's been indicted would be unprecedented. I mean, back in 2002, for example, Andrew Cuomo lost the Democratic primary and he was stuck on the liberal line in the general election. And the liberals lost their ballot line as a result of that election because Cuomo wasn't campaigning. You know, he didn't want to you know, be a spoiler for the Democrats. And uh, the liberals never recovered from that. So, you know, just in terms of the politics of the race, the, the current corporate Democrat, who's the governor, Kathy Hochul, is far ahead in the polls. She's challenged from the right by Tom Swasey from Long Island, who's a conservative Democrat, kind of like an old school Republican in his policies. And Jamani Williams, who's a progressive black politician from Brooklyn, who is the, currently the elected public advocate of New York City. And the working families endorsed Jumani, but uh, for the primary, but they've already promised that if he doesn't win the primary, they're going to back Hochul. You know, we have fusion in New York. That's why, you know, these candidates can be on more than one ballot line. Uh, but they're basically, <laughs> they're giving up on Jumani before the primary and giving away their leverage. You know, their statement is we never spoil the election. And uh, they also never proposed the solution to spoil the elections, which would be ranked choice voting for executive officers like governor. So if the Greens can get on the ballot, we'll be the only progressive alternative on the ballot. And of course, we're running for an equal socialist Green New Deal, 100 percent clean energy and zero emissions in New York within the next 10 years. Uh, a big public power, you know, public power at the municipal and state level to uh, build out this clean energy system uh, and to pay for it. We've got a tax the rich progressive tax reform program. Uh, it also includes an economic bill of rights. The New York Health Act, which is a state level Medicare for all program that the state assembly has been passing since the early 1990s. And Democrats said, well, give us the Senate and we'll get it passed. They've had the Senate for four years now and the bill doesn't even get out of committee, not even in the assembly. So that's why we need the Green Party to push this forward. Tuition free public college, part of the economic bill of rights, universal public child care or a cash benefit for home care for mothers. Uh, and a guaranteed income above poverty to end poverty, as I mentioned at the top, you know, we got a huge poverty issue here in New York State. Upstate New York is probably the poorest region in terms of child uh, poverty and family poverty in the country right now. And it was not debated, you not discussed in the budget they just passed. They rejected a proposal to replenish the excluded workers fund. Uh, there was a home, uh, there was a rental voucher program that would have helped a lot of renters a lot of people now they can be uh, evicted and it's you know becoming a huge issue again and all that was rejected and they didn't really they don't have an anti-poverty program that's why again we have the greens and then just to say a few words about national politics we got um immigration issue and of course the republicans don't want to rescind title 42 which you know, Trump administration and a court ordered the Biden administration to use it to exclude migrants because of COVID. And, you know, the hypocrisy is just unbelievable. You know, the Democrats and especially the Republicans are saying COVID is over, uh, except on the southern border. You know, why not vaccinate these people while they're coming through? Um, and so it looks like Title 42 is going to stay in in. Uh, effect because there are enough Democrats in Congress to join the Republicans to block that change. So we got, you know, we still got a Trumpian immigration policy with a Democratic president. And, you know, it just burns me up along with the fact that Biden and Schumer have given up on voting rights and election protection. Huge issues as we go into this midterms. The Republicans are suppressing voters and setting it up by getting control of the election administration to count the votes and steal elections. And the Democrats, you know, they can't lift a filibuster to pass voting rights and election protection legislation. But what they do have the energy do is to pass laws and make it harder for the Green Party to get on the ballot. Not just here in New York, but Arkansas, Nevada and other states. <clears throat> uh, 
And then we got more bad news on the democracy uh, front. Florida just passed a state law preempting uh, municipalities from instituting ranked choice voting. Tennessee did that back in February. And these laws are, you know, preempting what cities in their states want to do, Sarasota and Florida and Memphis and Tennessee. And there was an initiative, attempt at initiative in Florida uh, to go around this law that they expected the Republicans to pass, but it didn't make it on the ballot this year. But that's what they're going to have to do in Florida to get ranked choice voting. And let's be clear, it's not just Republicans that are, uh, you know, preempting ranked choice voting. Remember in 2019, Democratic governor of California, Gavin Newsom, vetoed a ranked choice voting home rule bill, which, in other words, you wouldn't have to get state legislative approval to do ranked choice voting, which a number of cities do in California, and Newsom vetoed it. So, uh, you know, the, the fight for democracy, we're not going to get from the Democrats or the Republicans, for sure. Again, that's why we need the Green Party. And I'll just have one more comment on, you know, what happened this week with Ukraine on, I guess it was Sunday or Monday, uh, the Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin and the Secretary of State, uh, Anthony Blinken, were in uh, Ukraine. And uh, they said, our purpose now of what the United States is doing is not just to support Ukraine's independence, but to uh, weaken Russia militarily which turns it from supporting the national liberation of Ukraine into a proxy war using Ukraine with Russia, which is stupid. It feeds right into one of you know, Putin's narratives and his excuses for starting the war that you know, he's not fighting Ukraine, who he doesn't even acknowledge as a, a culture and a nation. Uh, he, he's fighting the West, you know, which is victimizing Russia. Um, and you know, this is a real problem because uh, Ukraine has put a reasonable peace proposal on the table, you know, neutrality rather than joining NATO uh, with its independence guaranteed by a treaty signed by the big powers, including the U.S. and Russia and uh, the big NATO powers. And then uh, negotiations to resolve the status of Luhansk, Donetsk and Crimea. And unfortunately, Russia has rejected that and the U.S. has been silent about it. So they're not really pursuing diplomacy. Uh, and I think where we're at is both want to see what they can do, both the U.S. and Russia. They can do militarily on the ground before they're ready to negotiate. But what that's doing for the Ukrainians, who are the, you know, the people that were attacked, is just uh, extending the war. So one thing that came out a couple of weeks ago that I think is worth reading, it's by Alfred McCoy. It's called How to End the War in Ukraine. And McCoy's been writing about imperialism since I was in the Marine Corps with a book he wrote then called The Politics of Heroin in Southeast Asia, which is about the U.S. covert participation in the heroin trade in the Golden Triangle uh, in Southeast Asia, which was helping to finance uh, the right wing dictators that we were supporting. And his latest book is called To Govern the World, uh, World Orders and Climate Change which is the best book I've read this year. It covers the last six centuries of imperialism and why and how the dominant imperialist powers have shifted over the centuries and why now the U.S. is declining uh, in its hegemony over the world system. Uh, but this is the interesting thing, I think, is you know China's rising, but uh, McCoy doesn't think it can become an imperial hegemon because of climate change, which is really going to undermine, it's going to hit China hard, as well as the rest of the world. And it's gonna you know, undermine the capacity of China or any other uh, great power from dominating uh, the world system. So I think that's a book worth reading. Um, and of course it underscores the need for a Green New Deal and a, a democratic world order. But anyway, this article that McCoy uh, wrote, How to End the War in Ukraine, he says the European Court of Human Rights, which Ukraine has already gone to uh, and got a a decision that, you know, Russia's invasion was illegal. Uh, they could ask the court to uh, garnish the gas income of Russia. Like, you know, you could garnish somebody's wages if, if they owe, uh, you know, compensation. Um, and in just the first five weeks of the war, the estimated damage to Ukraine is $68 billion, uh, to its civilian infrastructure 
and other losses worth about 600 billion or about three times the country's gross domestic product. So what the court could do is instruct the Council of Europe to direct all European corporations buying gas from the Russian state monopoly Gazprom to deduct say 20% of their regular payments for a Ukraine reparations fund for reconstruction. And uh, since Europe is now paying Gazprom about $850 million a day, uh, such a court order deduction uh, would force Russia basically to pay for the initial $600 billion in war damages, that debt over the next eight years. And uh, as long, of course, as long as this invasion continues, those numbers are going to rise. And McCoy argues that Russia would have little choice but to accept those deductions or watch their economy collapse because of the last la lack of gas, oil, and coal revenues. Um, and, you know, last month, uh, Russia wanted European countries to pay in rubles, and Germany just refused, and that's their biggest customer. And faced with the loss of such critical revenues, uh, Russia capitulated. So McCoy argues that this would be effective. I think that's, uh, you know, something to think about here in, in terms of uh, how to push Russia to uh, back off and let Ukraine be. So with that, I went on a little long today, but uh, I look forward to your questions and comments. Scout Trooper 164, this system feels like it's built as lose-lose. You try fighting it, you lose. You do nothing, you lose. The oligarchs have insane power. Yeah, but I've lived long enough to have won some. You know, we, we got civil rights. We got out of Vietnam. Uh, I was involved in the big occupation of the Seabrook nuclear power plant. After that, the nuclear industry didn't order a new nuclear power plant until the Obama administration. And only then, when the Obama administration had huge loan guarantees, um, we stopped fracking in New York, uh, which really, I mean, then we were up against really all the investors in the world, Saudis, Chinese, Europeans, as well as Americans. They called it the shale play. And, you know, we got 5% of the vote in 2014 as the Green Party gubernatorial ticket. And Cuomo had to compete for our uh, votes, you know, because he wanted to, in going into that election, wanted to run it up so he could uh, get the highest vote he got ever, more than his father got, Mario Cuomo, and, you know, use that as a credential to, you know, make a bid for the presidency. Instead, he got less. He had to compete for our votes. So, um, yeah, you know, the old saying it's attributed to Gandhi, although it's nobody can really track it to him. You know, first they uh, ridicule you. What is it? No, first they ignore you. Then they ridicule you. Then they fight you. And then you win. That's the way all these struggles are. So, um, you know, it does feel discouraging at times, but, uh, I think it's, you know, you got to look at history and, and look at the victories and then, uh, you know, be encouraged by that. Screen down a little bit. There I am. Okay, Scout Trooper at 164. Yeah, but there are a lot more, we're a lot more divisive than in previous times. We have different viewpoints. We have numerous points shoved down our throats. People who reveal the truth get punished and it sucks. Oh, you look at history. The, the McCarthy era was pretty rough. Uh, the repression after or during World War I was very rough, um, and that was very violent. Uh, the reaction to Reconstruction by the Ku Klux Klan and other militarized arms of the Democratic Party in the South was, you know, certainly more difficult than anything we're facing today in terms of the violence and in the repression and, you know, the, the division of opinion. I mean... Today, except in the far right uh, circles, you don't say racial discrimination is a good thing. The slogan of the Democratic Party in the South back during Reconstruction and its aftermath was white supremacy. So again, I, I suggest, you know, get a historical perspective and, you know, the progressive fight is always difficult, but, you know, it's a good fight. And you, you said in the first uh, thing that, you know, whether you act or not, uh, it sucks, but I'll tell you, if you're acting and, and trying to fight, it feels a lot better than, you know, just sitting home and moping. Diana Maria, have you tried a church to get signatures? 
Uh, yeah, I haven't actually myself, um, but I, you know, some of my petitioners here in Syracuse uh, are in churches and or outside big churches and, and, you know, talking to people when they come out from services. So, um, and actually there's one church here. It's a, you know, uh, what do they call it? Kojic church of God in Christ. That's uh, that pastor will let me get signatures in the church. So I got to get there one of these Sundays. So yeah, we've, uh, that's, that's part of our plan. Sensi, I was recently banned from Reddit for telling a neo-Nazi to F off. How do you feel about large tech companies engaging in censorship? Um, I don't like it. Um, I think, and this has always been true in the public square, you've got to take on uh, the ideas you oppose and detest uh, by beating them into argument and being engaged. And, you know, here again, you know, a lot of this, one thing that tech companies should do and, and have done to some extent is it's one thing for a real live person to put their stupid opinion out there. It's another thing to have that amplified uh, artificially by bots and things like that. So I think there's, you know, some regulation there. But, um, you know, if you let these, uh, you know, for example, the neo-Nazi, the racist views go underground, then the people are going to propagate that and recruit people to that movement. And there'll be no public counter speech to it. Um, now, the tech companies, I think, have too much power in terms of our communications today. And that's why, you know, during the campaign, we were talking about maybe making them into public utilities. So they're democratically controlled and regulated. Um, and they're not motivated by a profit motive, but by, you know, public values like, you know, free speech and uh, fair exchange of ideas. Uh, that would be a lot better than having Elon Musk just buy a Twitter. And, you know, now it's one guy running it. And that's problematic. That guy has too much power. Richest man in the world. And now he's got Twitter. Um, so, you know, we need to protect our areas of free speech and exchange. And sometimes that requires, you know, public uh, regulation and even ownership. Um, one thing that is being done a little bit in New Jersey and been discussed about elsewhere is the state gives grants to local journalists to do investigative journalism because in the current media environment when so many people are online uh local newspapers have had it i mean they've really a lot of them have gone out of business and so now there are no reporters locally covering what's going on in city hall or the county seat and uh you know that's very important news that ought to be covered but the profit motive or, or model for that kind of journalism at the local level and pretty much also at larger levels, it just doesn't work now and it's going online. So uh, I think that's another area. And what we've suggested for regulating that is rather than boards appointed by politicians or boards uh, elected where big money can have an influence on the election, elect people by lot like juries. So you get a random sample of the public uh, and that would reflect uh, better the public interest than appointments or elections. So those are some thoughts. But yeah, the uh, media environment, that's another issue. There's just no debate about the reforms needed or very little. And unfortunately, you know, the Democrats who uh, tend to bring this up, you know, they're, they're talking about, you know, banning people like Trump. Um, and, you know, like I said, you let you let the right wing go underground and underground uh, they'll they'll develop their ideas and their following without challenge. It's got to be above ground. Sunlight is the best disinfected, as old Judge Brandeis once said. I think he once said it. A lot of those quotes, you try to track them down and you find out the one it's attributed to didn't really say it, or you can't prove it. Scout Trooper 164, what do you think of Obama's podcast being dropped from Spotify? I didn't know that, and I don't know why. Uh, maybe you can tell us a little bit in the chat. And uh, I just have no idea. It's news I hadn't heard. Frankie Lee. Howie, what would your response be to a, to COVID as governor of New York? Well, first of all, you know, do what the public health science says needs to be done. And if that's as, you know, they're now recommending, the CDC is now recommending that 
37 counties in New York uh, require indoor masking. Now, the federal government can't mandate, but the state can. Now, our Democratic governor hasn't done that. Um, so we expect the, you know, the COVID cases to rise and uh, people are dying here every day in my county. Um, and that's not right. Um, so I would be, you know, on the side of caution to protect. We've had devastating uh, casualties in New York. 12% of the people that were living in uh, long-term care facilities at the start of the pandemic uh, died from COVID uh, so far. And, uh, you know, that's just unacceptable. So, uh, you know, encourage vaccination as the, you know, the doctors and the public health officials say. Um, and then as far as, you know, the lockdowns, I know China's really going in on that. We'll have to see how that works for them. I know they're having difficulty with this highly contagious uh, Omicron BA2 version. Um, and there are subversions of that that are circulating around here. Um, but I think, you know, the social distancing, the masking, the vaccinations, and ventilation in public buildings. I mean, that's an area where, like in our schools, I know our teachers in New York have been demanding that, particularly in New York City. So in general, my response would be, you know, follow the science and uh, don't get caught up like current governor did. The Republicans are whining about, you know, mandates. And so she got rid of them uh, as soon as she could. And now we're in another COVID wave and she's not responding. That's that's not in the public interest. Howie, will you be switching to an electric car or sticking to gas? Gas prices are still ranking up or cranking up. Um, you know, it's a matter of economics. I'm on a tight budget. I'm living off a pension. I'll add Social Security later this year when I turn 70. Uh, but it's, you know, a pretty big upfront cost. And I usually buy a used car. Now, you know, I, I would get, I prefer an electric car. I've, I've driven them as a rental. Um, you know, the thing that uh, you got to watch out for, I found out is they're so quiet that people would just walk right out on the street in front of you. So you got to be careful about that. Um, but the basic, the general idea of switching to electrified transportation, um, we can't just rely on uh, consumer incentives because you have to have a certain level of income to be able to take advantage of those, you know, uh, tax rebates and you know it just doesn't fit for somebody in my income bracket uh what we ought to have is uh upfront financing and then a payback that's you know low interest and can be met because the money you're saving from gas because it's cheaper to you know charge the car is what you can use to pay back the loan um, and there should be you know maybe grants to lower income people as well and also, of course, we want to, you know, move people more and more off the roads with personal vehicles and on the mass transit and do the same thing with freight, of course, you know, from these big diesel 18 wheelers uh, onto, you know, railroads. And then, you know, the last mile or a few miles would be by electric trucks. Um, anybody who says they're not powerful enough doesn't know. I mean, electric uh, engines can have all the torque you want. In fact, think about a, you know, a diesel uh, electric locomotive. They use the diesel, they used to use coal to charge an electric motor uh, because it just, it can, it's stronger. So um, yeah, the electric uh, power is powerful and we just need better policies to encourage it both in freight transit as well as moving people. Linda Templin, what are your thoughts on climate fallback cities and climate refugee areas? I haven't heard the term climate fallback cities, but I imagine it's like where people in Miami go after Miami goes underwater. And I just heard on the radio uh, in the last day or two that uh, 
Miami is where more people are moving to than any other city on, on in the United States. I wonder if they know that the sea level is rising is already, you know, flooding parts of uh, Miami on a regular basis in climate refugee areas. Uh, well, I think we've got to anticipate uh, that we're going to have to build further from the coastline. Uh, these are opportunities to build in a green manner with uh, 100% renewable clean energy, efficiency, uh, green building materials, some of which can sequester carbon. Um, and we better get ready for this because, you know, if we think we got a lot of people at the southern border now, uh, climate change, you know, according to the different estimates is between 200 million and a billion people in the next three decades are going to be moving because their homes are being wiped out. You know, their uh, the temperature will be in uh, compatible with human habitation. Um, there'll be agricultural areas destroyed by drought or flooding from oceans flooding, you know, the Mekong Delta, Bangladesh, where a lot of rice is grown. Uh, so people are going to be on the move. And, you know, the U.S. being a rich country, we should, you know, play our part and set a good example. Otherwise, you know, if you think uh, immigration has caused conflict at this point, just wait. we got to have a, you know, a global response to this. And again, that's another area where instead of uh, having those kind of discussions, you know, the U.S. wants a Cold War and uh, you know, Russia wants to take over Ukraine and, you know, China's building up its military. We're going in the wrong direction. Um, we should be, even though we don't agree on a lot of things in terms of policy, these countries, we got to talk with each other about the climate issue, the nuclear arms race, the refugee problem that's going to develop. And uh, it's just uh, being realistic and practical. And Unfortunately, we don't have enough of that in our national leadership in this country, for sure. Title, Dragon Ruler of Waterfalls. Sorry if you've mentioned it before, but what are your thoughts on Emmanuel Macron's victory last Sunday? Well, I'm, I'm glad he beat uh, Marine Le Pen, who was a far-right candidate, a racist, uh, a Putin apologist, and... Her, her party's been funded by Putin or, you know, by banks in, in Russia that are close to the, you know, Putin inner circle. So that's a good thing. The problem is he's a, you know, a neoliberal uh, who has actually moved to the right since he was elected. So he's not a real solution to the problems France faces or that we all face. I think it'll be interesting to watch what happens in their uh, parliamentary elections, which are next. And, uh, the coalition on the left around Melanchthon, I don't know if I pronounced his name right, can't speak French, but uh, he came close to knocking Le Pen out in, in second place and would have been in the runoff. And I read an article yesterday where he's seeking to build a, a left coalition with the old Socialist Party, which got, you know, tiny percent, you know, like 3% of the vote uh, in the first round of the presidential election. Uh, the Green Party, which did better and has done much better in municipal and uh, parliamentary elections to have a you know united front of the of the independent left um and i think that's hopeful if they can pull that off the french left has been pretty contentious but maybe they've learned their lesson and, and will you know put aside their differences to unite around their commonalities and that could have a big impact on france it would basically you know require macron to uh work with the left in the in the french uh, parliament so that's the next phase in their election process. And that's what I'm going to be watching. Michael Shin, I've been recommended No Shortcuts, Organizing for Power in the New Gilded Age by Jane McElvey. The, your thoughts on it, if you've read it. Yeah, I've read, I haven't finished it. I got stopped by something in the middle of it. But what I read, you know, as far as I read was, uh, you know, pretty good information. Uh, a lot of experience, you know, his history. Um, so I think, yes, it's a, it's a good uh, book to read. And the no shortcuts thing is, you know, I think her critique is 
the unions have done too many corporate campaigns where they hire public relations firms to make the corporation they're having a conflict with look bad. And she says, you know, the power that comes from unions is comes from the workers because they're the ones on the jobs. They're the ones that can strike. They're the ones that can file grievances and, uh, you know, hold supervisors and, and you know, abusive bosses uh, to account. Uh, if you don't organize the workers, uh, you don't have the power. So the basic thesis of our book, I agree with that uh, there's no shortcut around organizing the workers. And a lot of our, you know, established unions have stopped doing that. And, you know, I've been I've seen that in the Teamsters. I think the problem there is institutional and in that the uh, most of these unions have elected leadership. The problem is the elected leaders don't want the workers organized because they might, you know, elect some other people. They might get organized and elect an alternative slate. So they tend to go around their own workers and that takes away their power. And they do these, you know, corporate campaigns, the public relations stuff. And Jane McElvey, as I recall in that book, is very good at criticizing that and saying there's no shortcut around organizing the workers, which is, you know, painstaking, patient. You need patience. You know, you got to talk to people on a consistent basis and, you know, coax them along. And uh, but that's you can't you can't go around that. So there's no shortcuts. So, yeah, I recommend that's a good book to read. Title, Dragon Ruler Waterfalls. What will you most prioritize when elected governor? Uh, well, inclusive democracy. You know, we got to enable the, the game changer for the Greens. And I believe our democracy will be getting proportional representation in legislative bodies. Then every political viewpoint will get its share of representation that's proportional to its vote. The way it is now, most districts, we have single member district, winner take all elections. Most districts are not competitive. It's either majority Democrat or majority Republican. So if you're in a majority Republican district, it's not just the Greens that don't get a representative, it's the Democrats. Um, if you have proportional representation, everybody gets their fair share of representation. And that will create a multi-party system instead of this negative back and forth between the two parties because it pays to go negative when you only have one opponent. But when there's more than one, you attack one. The one that's not attacked looks clean and, uh, you know, they rise in stature. So it's a whole different dynamic. So that's what I emphasize. Fair ballot access, ranked choice voting for the statewide offices, and proportional representation in the state legislature. Um, that changes the whole dynamic of the politics. Of course, you know, it's hard to say number one priority without mentioning the others, but we got to deal with the climate crisis and we got to deal with the crisis of extreme inequality and poverty because that's a life or death issue like the climate is. You know, people uh, are, you know, having to decide between paying the rent and, and feeding themselves. And uh, we have what they call deaths of despair. You know, people abusing drugs and alcohol, including the uh, opioids uh, that, you know, is killing more and more of us. And a lot of that is because people just feel hopeless on the economic side. So um, it's a life or death issue as well. Um, so those are priorities as well. But the thing I think I bring that none of the other candidates or parties have or would or will is, you know, restructuring our electoral system so it's more democratic small d victoria von blood what else can be done for persons with disabilities that aren't being done now well i think affordable housing is a big issue and the ability to uh, have independent living which public housing can do it should integrate people with disabilities, not segregate them into their own special buildings, um, but enable them to be independent if they need different services to do that, uh, that can be provided through uh, public housing. So I think a lot more of that can be done um, in, you know, here in New York State for sure. Um, and then, you know, we need to look at the uh, job and payment discrimination against people with disabilities who have jobs, they're not getting comparable pay for comparable work. You have these kind of sweatshops where they 
specialize in hiring disabled people to do kind of rote work that many of them, uh, you know, are much more capable of doing. They're, they're capable of doing much more interesting and, and challenging work, but they get shipped into there. They're paid minimum wage. And, uh, you know, that's not right. They should not be discriminated against. We have laws here against that, but, you know, enforcing those laws is another thing that needs to be done more than it is. And I'm sure there's more on the disability agenda that I will hear about during the campaign. Because one thing about I know in New York is the disability community is well organized and they will let you know. I actually got some signatures from some uh, people who've been active in the disability movement um, for a long time. So um, they said they'd be talking to me. They didn't want to bend my ear while I was getting signatures, but I'm sure there's a lot more I, I need to know. Well, seeing no more questions, um, I guess I'm supposed to wrap up. Uh, I said a lot at the beginning, and I, I don't think I want to repeat any of that. I see the hawkinsmatera.org donate banner up there, yes, uh, or, or website. Yes, we need donations. They're pretty much all the money's now going into petitioning. We've hired, I think, uh, eight or 10 or 12 petitioners around the state who can you know, spend more time than those people that have regular jobs. Uh, getting those signatures, we need their help. So that, that's what you'll be paying for. We're paying $20 an hour. Uh, that's the living wage, minimum wage that we're proposing you know, for the state. And of course we couldn't go out there and pay people less than that. So uh, people are getting paid a decent wage for, for that work. So if you can donate, we would greatly appreciate it. And, it's for a good cause. And, it, you know, wherever you are in the country, if we can get a ballot line in 2022, get this petition done, and then in the fall get a, it's going to take at least 150,000 votes. Uh, but, you know, that's 2% or greater than 2%. Uh, we will have a ballot line for whoever the Greens run in 2024 uh, in New York State, which, of course, is a big, important state. But also, it will save that campaign a lot of money trying to get back on the ballot with this crazy, stupid, worst in the world petition of 45,000 signatures in 42 days. Um, maybe we can get those legislators to uh, come to their senses and, and improve that. Um, we've been in court. We're still in court. We got on our lawsuit against this law. Uh, next hearing is in the fall, so it's too late for this election. So we'll be working on this, but the surest way to make sure the Green Party's on the ballot line in 2024 is to achieve that ballot status this year in 2022. So whatever you can contribute to help us with that um, will be greatly appreciated. So thanks everybody for being here this week. We'll be back here next week and uh, give you an update on what's been going on. And I'll try to not talk so much at the beginning so we can get more questions in. So have a good week. Take care.